Well, good morning again, everybody, and we're glad you are here this morning. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we'll get into this morning's message. Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be here in your house and together with our church family to worship you together in song, to, to worship you uh, together uh, through our giving. And now, Lord, we desire to be hearts that are open, prepared, ready to receive the seed of your word. And I pray, Lord, that's what I speak here today. And I ask for you, Holy Spirit, to be the teacher that I know you will ensure that each one who is here in person or who is with us online, that they will receive whatever it is that you know that they need today. Now repeat the last part after me. Holy Spirit, Spirit. be my teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I guess maybe in a little more like kind of lighthearted way to talk about, uh, about unity, there's always things that can divide us. And so in our house this week, there was debate. And I guess this is going around right now, this debate about whether cheesecake is a cake or it's a pie. <laughs> it's important. And so I'm going to share with you uh, what's right. <laughs> Actually, what, I, what we found out on the internet is that it's technically neither. It's a, it's a tart, but which is a kind of a pie. So I'm right. But I wonder why, why did, if it's a high, why did they call it cheesecake? See, it created all kinds of issue, right? So it's a cake. But here's, I have some, I had some, I, I felt it made some pretty strong points in our discussion this week. Well, first of all, a, a, a cake doesn't have a, a graham cracker crust, right? A pie does, right? There's no flour and egg in cheesecake. I think that the reason they call it a cake is no one wants to eat something called cheese pie. <laughs> but why is that? Why are we okay with cheesecake? Because cause in our heads, I think, and we're talking about the brain here, the way we think, right? So in our heads, cake is sweet. But pie could be savory. So a cheese pie, you're like, that sounds kind of gross. Or totally delicious. I don't know, but I guess depending on your, your affinity for cheese. But that was our discussion this week. It wasn't really divisive at all, but especially because I knew I was right. <laughs> We're talking, we're going to continue today, and I found out last service, not nearly as far as I thought. Here, I wrote, because I told you today, we've been, well, we've been talking about, about rewiring and renewing our, our brain and how it thinks, because, you know, our, our mind, uh, well, understanding the mind and the brain are two different things, but the, 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 our brain is, is running all sorts of programs by default that are, are driving us all in the wrong directions. And... Uh, and understanding that, that it needs renewal, and that there's a process, and we're going to be talking about this process, and of course, my hope was to give you the, the five parts of this 21-day brain detox thing today, and, and then this morning, I thought, well, or even yesterday, I was like, I may only get through two of them, but the other three are pretty quick, but then I was going through my notes again this morning, I thought, no, I think I can do this, I can get through these five this morning, and last service, I got through one, <laughs> so this series keeps getting longer. Um, one of our, our goals coming out of this will be to, that we're going to have a, a, a group that's formed that uh, for anybody who wants to be a part of it is not saying that I have mental illness, but it's saying that I, I want to get around some people who are also working on this thing over these next 21 days to renew my mind. And so we'll have details on that next week uh, about how to get involved with that. Uh, but uh, so we're going to begin digging into that, what that process looks like. There's, there's five parts or steps to the process. And again, I guess I can uh, be uh, a little more clear up front that we're going to get through one of them this morning. Uh, but it's the, the first two are really the most critical in understanding. And, and, and I could get through all of these quickly today, and I could also teach on them for 10 weeks. Uh, but we're going we're to give you a, a, at least enough of the scriptural understanding for what, this, what it is that you're doing and why it works. And so, you know, the, 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 some of the things we've talked about already up to this point, I can't do a whole lot of review or really much of any. Uh, but uh, I want to give you at least a little bit, and if you haven't been here for the other three parts we've done, I encourage you to jump online because it may fill in some, some gaps that you may think that we're leaving here today. But th- the first thing that we did talk about that was important already here was that there's a difference between the mind and the brain. Uh, the mind is, is the, at the core and the soul part of who you are. Uh, the brain is, is a physical piece of equipment that we have. Uh, and that, that, that it is subservient to the mind uh, because we are, we are created as a three-part being and there's a hierarchy. You are a spirit. That's who God made you to be. It has the highest authority in your life too. And then your, your soul is the kind of who you are, what makes you you. 
your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then your flesh, your body, is what we all see. But it's actually the lowest on the totem pole of who you actually are. Why it's so silly that we would be judging other people by the appearance of what they look like or, or any, any, anything like that, because that's not who they are. Who we are is spirit. So, so understanding this, that, that the mind has the authority to take control over what the brain's doing. But our brain, as we looked at last week, has been, pre, has been programmed over time, either by, by information, by genetics, by experiences, all sorts of things that, that have programmed it, and it's making 99% of your decisions automatically. You don't, quote unquote, think about it, consciously think about it. You're making decisions. Uh, you, you're, how you're reacting to things. Everything is happening automatically by what's in there, but what we have to recognize is there's some things running in there that are causing us to do things that aren't really good ideas. Right? That, that we're train wrecking our life by allowing the programs just to continue to run. But we're going to take some authority over them with the, with, over what's happening in the subconscious, say, no, uh, we're going to consciously take over some of these decisions until we can get the non-conscious part of who we are to, to make the decisions the right way. And so what we've also been finding is, is, is that science has actually shown us that you can rewire your brain. You know, uh, several decades ago, it was kind of believed that you're just kind of made up the way you are, because I think really of, of not understanding the difference between the brain and the mind, that, that it just kind of you're wired a certain way. Uh, but understanding now that, that the, what, what we think and meditate on is physically changing the structure of our brains. Right? And, and this isn't just like, you know, mumbo jumbo, new agey, science-y stuff. No, this is, this, it's fact. You are changing the structures inside your brain based on what you are thinking about. And so uh, we, we get in these, these bad cycles because we're, we're thinking on the wrong things. And then that creates more of the structure that likes to think about the wrong things, which thinks about wrong things and creates more structure that thinks about the wrong things. And, and it's, it's a, it is, it, until we become active in changing it, we continue in that same road. And so we want to be good stewards of what we've been given. Your brain was given to you as a resource. It's, it's a tool. It's something that God has given you uh, to do a lot of things, like, you know, just run what's going on inside your body, but also to, to, to run your life. I saw this, I didn't read this last uh, service, but this was a, a quote Pastor Tammy sent me uh, from uh, Mark Hankins. I love Mark Hankins. He said, your mind is not designed to run your life. It was designed to organize your life. Your spirit was designed to run your life. You must engage your spirit to run your life. That's what we're trying to do, is to, to retrain ourselves to put the spirit in charge of programming the brain and what it's going to think and what it's going to do and the decisions it's going to make. We want to get it into alignment and we're going to restructure the way it thinks. All right, so that's as much of, of the review parts that I can really get to today, probably more than I even should have with the time I have. But I guess there's a little stress now because I know I'm only going to get through one of these. So this is a five-part plan. And so as we dig into this plan, and if you haven't, I think I mentioned the name of the book finally last week. If you're interested in this and learning more of the insight in it and maybe even doing this, this program, I encourage you to pick up this book and I don't get any royalties off of it, so I'm not, doing some, I'm not trying to do anything weird here. Uh, but it's a book called Switch on the Brain by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Actually, my daughter told me that it's like on sale on Amazon for like nine bucks right now. Probably the best nine bucks you're going to spend to help you to change the way you think. Uh, but she came up with, and she's a, a spirit-filled believer who is also a, a professional in this field. And, and so she's come up with this 21-day plan because she said scientifically it's shown that you can, if you will actively work at it, you can change the ways you're thinking within 21 days. When I say actively working at it, right? Actively is more than just, you know, putting a piece of paper with a scripture on it on your fridge. Although for some of us, you see that a lot. <laughs> so I was going there. There's some other things that need some reprogramming maybe in our lives. But uh, it is, is, is taking an active role in, in taking authority over what the brain is going to think about and, and, and what it's going to produce. 
And so uh, the first step in this plan, I remember I told you last week it was a five step, but I wasn't going to give you all the names because if you don't have the context and know what they are, you may misunderstand because of the kind of thinking you have now and think I'm talking about something else totally different. But the first step is called gathering. So what is gathering? In the simplest form, but we're going we're to dig into it a little bit and, and, and show you in scripture what this is talking about. Uh, but gathering is, is really t- kind of taking an inventory of what's going on up here. What are you thinking about? Uh, and being very purposeful in it. And I think the, the, maybe the first time or the first couple times you try to sit down and do this, it's hard. Right? It's like, you're like, I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't, especially if you're a guy, because that's what we always get. Women always ask us, what are you thinking? We're like, nothing. <laughs> I'm not thinking anything right now. I was just thinking about eating something, I think. Right, but but it's getting a, 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 taking control over. We're not at a point of trying to change things yet. Because here's one of the other things that, that, that neuroscientists have found is that with memories and thoughts, when you move them out of the non-conscious part and pull them into the conscious part, they can now be dealt with and manipulated. And so this is, to me, it's a great example of taking what the enemy meant for harm and turning it for good because you, you tend to retrieve some of these thoughts and these memories and these things that are running in the background and they think that when you're pulling them out, you're given a chance they can go do what they want, but what you're going to do is take them captive and then we're going to destroy them and we're going to replace them with God's truth. All right, so, so when something has been running in the background in the non-conscious, it's kind of doing what it does in the background, but you pull it into the conscious and now you have an opportunity to examine it. You have an opportunity to, to change it, and to, to cut off some branches that need some cutting off in our brain and start building new ones. And so by bringing, bringing to the conscious, if you remember in the very first week, <coughs> I knew that this was a little bit of a process and I want to make sure I had given you something right away that you could start doing that would help. If you may remember, I told you that when you are meditating on God's word and his promises, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, to attach emotion to it. Because emotion is powerful in, in building these non-conscious thoughts and memories. So I, I remember I told you, you know, imagine what, what does my like, life look like when that promise comes to pass? How will I feel when I see that come to pass? Right? Because the, the, the attaching emotion, emotion to it is powerful. Well, this is kind of what we're, we're kind of reverse engineering some of the things that we've been having running in the background in our heads is, is we're thinking on what are some of these thoughts I've had? Well, what are the emotions attached to that? What emotions come up when I, when I think about that? Uh, that, and, and, and let me back up a step here because there's kind of a step before the step one or the very beginning of step one is this. In, in John chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit is given to us and is going to lead us in all truth. And so when you're in the process of trying to, to pull out some things that have been kind of running in the background, maybe even some, some of the things you're very conscious of and you know exactly what, what thinking needs to change, but there's also some things you don't realize. There's some ways of thinking that you have uh, that, that, that you aren't aware of. So when you begin kind of digging for these things, it's very important to employ the Holy Spirit right from the start. Right? The Holy Spirit will lead you in, in all truth. See, because uh, there are things that I, I, I believe is I have conversations with people about this from time to time, about you know, dealing with things out of their past or maybe dealing with generational uh, sin or curses, all kinds of things from maybe even previous generations or just earlier in their life, things that happened to them when they were children. And you always need to employ the Holy Spirit when you, when you seek to do those things. Because I believe that God has created us so that we do forget some things. Right? He knows how we're wired. And there are some things that he has helped you forget, that, but they still happened. And the enemy knows they happened. So if you're just kind of a blanket, I'm out there looking for things that maybe happened in the past that make me think the way I do, the enemy would be glad to show you things that God did not intend for you to bring back up again. He already dealt with them. All right, so employ the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads you in truth and shows you sometimes the, the, the thought that you think you need to deal with isn't the one that needs to be dealt with. The Holy Spirit knows if we deal with this other one that you're actually even unaware of, or if we fix that one, this one will stop. Right? You're focused on trying to get rid of fruit and he's trying to find the tree that's producing the fruit. Right? So always employ the Holy Spirit. 
or, or if to put the negative, negative on it, don't ever try to do something, these type of things without asking the Holy Spirit. Right? It's, so it's, it's important to do this. So employ the Holy Spirit and then become, bring some of these thoughts into consciousness so they can be dealt with. See, because what we have been doing is they come into consciousness, we don't deal with them. Remember, when, when, when these thoughts come to consciousness, we have a choice. We looked at a, a couple weeks ago, God says that I set before you today uh, life and death, blessing and curse. You, you get to choose. And on a daily basis, these thoughts are coming to consciousness and we are choosing instead of dealing with them to meditate on them some more and think about them some more. And what do we do when we do that? We strengthen them. We're going to get to, in one of the, the steps a little bit further down the line, showing how the, the, th- the things that we are thinking on are actually strengthening them and reinforcing their ability to continue to influence everything we're doing. So, so we're just, we're working at bringing these things together and understanding what makes them tick. You know, the, the, the thoughts that are, that are controlling what you do and the decisions you're making are controlled by really two things. They are, there's the, the five senses. So as, as these thoughts are coming up, pay attention to how the five senses are involved. You know, I find weird things like uh, over, over the years, I found that why am I feeling kind of weird? And all of a sudden, I'll kind of isolate. There's some smell that reminded me of something from another part of my life that, all, that triggered something. Maybe start thinking, and it's going, oh, wait, that's why I'm thinking that. Or it's, uh, maybe, there's been times where, like, I watched a movie that I hadn't watched in, since I was a kid, and, and watching that movie suddenly triggered something from that time in my life. Again, get the Holy Spirit involved. Don't get, like, weird and, and reading into every single thing that there's something to it. The Holy Spirit will help you find where there is. Right, but... but, but uh, Pay attention to how the five senses are involved with how you're, you're feeling or when that thought comes up. Because right? this is what, what fed you information. It's going to help you figure out what keeps triggering weird things in your life. That, that you find out that there is some weird, it's an, some image or some, whatever it is that, that, that does this. The Holy Spirit will help you find it and bring it into captivity so it doesn't keep bothering, keep causing problems in your life. So describing it, describing your surroundings, even what you're seeing around you. Remember, we're not controlled by what's going on around us, but we need to be aware of what's going on around us. Give me five minutes. Right, five minutes. A little communication here on the side. Okay, now, bringing, uh, uh, involving emotions. So what's happening... When, when you, and they find that when you bring a thought out of the non-conscious into the conscious, remember I, I said that you, you, your brain's made up, it's, it's forming all these little branches and trees. And they say that when you bring one of these thoughts into consciousness, it's, it, it begins to be like a breeze blowing across, they say anywhere from like four to seven different trees that, are, that may be connected to other things. It's like a breeze that blows. So what we're doing in this gathering is, is kind of isolating what trees are getting moved by this. When this thought comes, how, it's impacting some other trees around it, right? It's starting a little, a little wind that starts moving some things around, and we're, we're beginning to identify what some of those things are, again, by the, by the Holy Spirit's help. But emotions, bringing up emotions, it's important for us to understand just the same way that, that we, we had to understand that the brain and the mind are two different things, that emotions and feelings are really two different things. The emotion really is uh, what's attached to the thought or the memory. And, and it's what probably made that thought or memory so impactful and has stuck with you so long because there's emotion attached to it. The same way, again, I told you, attach emotion when you're meditating on God's word. It's going to make it more powerful and stick with you better. Right? So there was an emotion attached. The feeling is kind of the, the, the fruit of the emotion. Right? Jesus said, you can be angry and sin not. You can have the emotion of anger, but it's what you let the feeling cause you to do. Right? We, we hear things like, well, they, they always make me feel this way. And then you've heard people say, well, nobody can make you feel anyway. You allow them to. And, and you get annoyed when somebody tells you that. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> right? the, the, it is, it's the separating the emotion from the feeling. I have this emotion, but I'm not going to let it make me feel a certain way. We're going to deal with that emotion. Okay, so um, 
But then emotions are so important because emotions influence our attitude. When I say attitude, I'm not just talking about like what, what you get from little kids when you tell them they can't get the toy at the checkout at Target. Right, that, there's attitude, and then there's attitude when they're teenagers, and then there's attitude, right? And we have to admit it sometimes as parents, we have attitude as well. But attitude, right, from, the, from the understanding of like flying a plane, the attitude is your, your angle, your, your, your traveling at. It's determining where you've heard attitude determines altitude. Right, so your attitude, how you're allowing that emotion to influence you is determining an attitude. And so no amount of wanting to change is going to, you're not going to start moving upward if your attitude is still downward. Right, if you're continuing to allow the emotion to drive you downward, no matter how much you say you're trying to change and you want to change, you're not going to, or you're not going to see fruit. You're going to keep, keep on the crash course. We're trying to change the crash course, change the attitude by controlling emotion and how it's going to influence. So the, the no, I'm going to skip that because I didn't get that last service. Okay, go with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'll pull that thought in elsewhere. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is showing us kind of this, this process uh, of taking thought captive, being aware of what it is that you're thinking and not letting it influence you. And so, it starts with therefore, and I don't really have time to get back to the, I said last service I was going to, and I didn't have time. But it, there's a therefore for a reason. Well, we might get to it. <laughs> therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and a body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed uh, as these." Or like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Okay, so he, he began in here by, by telling you to, in verse 25, do not worry about your life. Now, I grew up, this is the New King James, I grew up in the, in the King James Bible, it said, take no thought. And so, and both are correct, uh, that it's understanding what, what the word thought is here. But sometimes we, we, we get a misunderstanding of what this means. Religiously speaking, it got to be, well, you're not supposed to think about what you're wearing. Why do you even care about those things? And then sometimes, if I could just be honest, you look at some people and go, they clearly haven't thought about what they're wearing since 1974. <laughs> But that's not what it means, that we're not supposed to even think about what we wear. Right? So, so when the New King James translated, it did pull uh, the, the definition of that word to thought, is to worry. And, and sometimes we can still even misunderstand because we, in, in common vernacular, we kind of throw, away the, throw around the term, well, don't worry about it, and not really understand what that really means. It says, don't worry about those things. This word thought, it, the word here, the Greek word, was, to, it was worry, fear, anxiety. Right? So Jesus said, okay, so don't allow the, the worry, fear, and anxiety, the fear about these things consume you. Why? Because, well, Jesus, remember, he's the son of God. He's in, he's in complete unity with his father. He's one with his father. His father designed us, and he designed our brains. And he knows that when you begin to meditate in fear about the needs that you have, what it's going to do. 
it's going to create more and more problems in your brain. And you're going to have a hard time not worrying about the things around you because that's what you've programmed yourself to do. Right, and so what does he say to do? Well, the, the, then he says to, to look at some things around you. And here, I, did, I forgot to, this is where I didn't make the reference last service. The therefore, back starting at verse 22, he said that the eyes are the lamp of the body. Right, so what you're looking at is determining whether you're bringing any light to your body. So he says, what I want you to do is look at the things that he created. Now, I know it's really easy sometimes uh, and frustrating when you're, when you're dealing with, if, if you're one who deals with, with, uh, with depression or anxiety, and, and, and it's got to a point where you don't even know why you deal with it. You just, you just do. Right? And, and, and people go, well, just think about something happy. Or, or they want to point out, well, there's this good thing going on in your life. Why are you, why are you depressed? And it's so frustrating, right? But, but Jesus says that it's important to, to look at, remember what we studied a couple weeks ago in the model that, that God gave, he said to, to look at and meditate on and think on his goodness and the benefits of his ways of doing things. This was in Deuteronomy 30, right? So Jesus is reiterating that. Look at all the, look at the things around you, right? That, that, that stuff doesn't even matter really to God, but he takes care of it. How much more do you think he might take care of you? We're dealing with a little bit with the logic part, but you know that when we get into these kind of, in these, in these cycles, logic doesn't work. Right? You, you could explain over and over the, the truth about something to, some, to somebody, or you've had it happen to you. Someone trying to explain the truth about something to you, but you can't even hear it. You can't see it. And I'll get into why that is uh, next week, because there, there's a really... Uh, there's a system that takes place in your brain when, you're, when, when, you, when you get stuck in one of these loops. But he says, I want you to look at the things that I take care of and, and know how much more important you are to me. You're like, well, but then why doesn't he? I've asked him to take care of me so many times and he hasn't. Well, but you've asked him, but do you let him? You ask him to take care of you a thousand times, but how many times did you let him take care of you? Or did we get back into our worry and our fear and our anxiety again? Within 30 seconds of asking him to take care of the problem, we get back to our worrying. All right, God, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to get back to my worrying and you just let me know when you're going to take care of it. No, that, what did I do? I took it back. Right? I, and so it, it, is, it is what we're looking at. But then the last thing he says, he said, take no thought saying. The saying is an important thing. And here's where he's given you, this is sort of the fail safe. That you know what, maybe you got some stuff going in your head and you got some fear and some worry and some anxiety and, and, and depression, all these things happening in your, in your head. And, and if what you can do is, is maybe you don't have the ability to take that authority over what you're thinking yet, but at least stop it from coming out of your mouth. That's the first step. If I, can, if I can stop it from coming out of my mouth, that's my beginning. And then now when I've seen I'm able to do that, maybe I can be able to start stopping the thought. Right? He, he's giving you a, a way to know that I'm doing something and it might be working. Now, because remember, attitude is determining your thought, not your thoughts, it's determining your actions and your words, your attitude. So you're, you're checking your attitude. Right? It's It's... I, I'm feeling all this and this is all going to my head. I can't see anything else, but if I can stop it from coming out of my mouth, I can af I'm forcing the attitude to, to change. Why? Because when I say it, now I keep speaking it, now I'm hearing it, and I'm spreading it more, and I'm reinforcing, I'm building those branches even stronger. So we're, we're trying to stop the process of it continuing to grow. Even if I can't replace it yet, I got to at least stop it from growing. So if, I, if I stop saying Right? It's, it's, it's that we get the report or we, or we, we, we can look around us right now and see uh, the, 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 if you're triggered by financial worry, then you've got a lot of things you could be worrying about right now. Right? We got our gas prices. We got prices going over. If you're a parent trying to find formula right now, right? it's crazy. You could be worried about it. So what do we do? We begin to, oh, I can't believe, I don't know what we're going to do start talking and we go online and we talk to our friends. We keep talking, reinforcing, right? Take no thought, say, if we can stop the saying, then we can eventually stop the thinking. 
Right? So we get to, we get to, to stopping this, this cycle of, of our attitude. Now, stress is a big part of this. Um, you know, the, the stress, if I if give you a definition of, of, of stress, my, my definition I've always kind of used of stress is this. Stress is where I see the problem here and I see my ability to solve it here. That stress, the gap between what I, what I, gap between what I need to do and what I believe I can do is my stress gap. And, and that, that they, they call, uh, they, they break down stress into different levels. I, I don't even like stress, but they call stress a, a stage one stress. It, it, they call good stress. It's what keeps you alert and focused in life. I, I would personally call it something else because I don't like stress. <laughs> but they call it stage one stress. But stage two and stage three is the bad stress. It's where it's running in your head. Right? You got that, you got that thing. It's, it's the, the, the bill you can't pay. The, what, the, what the doctor's report said, rolling around in your head over and over again. What's going on with the kids, going on and over and over in your head. It's the, what are we gonna do if the gas goes up anymore? Going around and around in your head. And, and it's that, that kind of stress, not as only as clinically proven to, to, to cause all kinds of physical problems in your body. The chemicals in your body get all messed up. Cancers grow in your body when you, when you stay under stress. That in your in your brain your brain changes in a stress situation. That they, they show that prolonged periods of, of being in the bad kind of stress actually breaks down and shrinks components in your brain that are needed to be able to process things correctly. It's actually causing brain damage to stay under stress. Right? Because you now remember again, because I'm under stress because I see the problem here and I see me here. Well, see, this is the good news that we have because we got Jesus, right? He is, he's more than enough, right? He, is, he has given me everything that pertains to life and godliness. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? I've been given an answer to keep that gap from growing in my life and keep the, the damage. They actually show that, 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 that staying, living a lifestyle of stress leads to memory loss, issues with, with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's coming out of people who live under stress. It's making a decision to say, I am not going to let that cycle continue in my life. It's saying, I'm going to take no thought saying. Until I can take no thought, I'm going to at least take no thought saying. And I'm going to work on taking no thought. I'm going to, I'm gathering, I'm identifying, I'm being honest with myself that I have these thoughts. And I'm identifying what triggers them or what's associated, what emotion, what, what are my five senses is going on because what am I doing? I'm bringing it out into the open and into the light yes. so that it can be dealt with. I'm making the decision this time. I'm, I, I bring these things, thoughts up every single day. I just do the wrong thing with them. I'm done reinforcing them. I've brought them out in the open and now we're going to deal with them. We're going to destroy them and replace them with the right thoughts with the, and, and, and being very purposeful about it replacing these things. Amen? Amen. So we'll pick up next week on our second step. And I promise the others will go faster. And I said this last service, I think that, uh, that I can get through the others all next week. I promise. Which just means I said nothing. I said, I promise that I think I can get through them. So I've got a career in politics. I can make promises that mean absolutely nothing. Sorry, I said that out loud. Let's pray though. Father, we do. We thank you for the, the power that you give us to, to take control of our thoughts. And as we ask your Holy Spirit to help us this week in gathering those thoughts, some of them that we may be very aware of, some of them that we may be unaware of, that you, by your Holy Spirit, bring the right things up and point us to the things, the, the five senses connected to them, to the emotions connected to those things. So we can begin to, to, to tear down those branches of what's in our head and begin to rebuild it. Begin to purposefully replace those branches with, with, the, with, with good branches, the truth of your word. We thank you for those things. I thank you that you will work in the hearts of everyone who has heard this today. Begin to show them that process. Begin to show them by your spirit those things that, that, are, that are running in their, in their brains that, just, that, that need to be brought out and need to be dealt with. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. 
Before I close our service, I want to make sure I provide you the opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. We're going to pray this prayer. It's based on Romans 10. tells us what we do to receive this gift of salvation, that you don't have to do anything to get your life right or to earn any of this, that it is a gift from God, that He asks us to do this, to, to confess with our mouths who Jesus is. That's what we'll do here in this prayer. And the only other thing that you're required to do, and, and I can't do this for you, is that you need to choose to believe what you're saying. All the, all the getting your life right and all that, it happens after Jesus comes in your life and he helps you with it. And, and, and I'll tell you, it doesn't all happen overnight. It's a lifetime of working with him and growing and becoming better. But right now, I'm just asking you to make that decision. So let's pray this prayer. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to come into my life, to come into my heart, to be my Lord, and my Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died for me, and you rose again, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that for the first time or if you recommitted your life to the Lord, I want to encourage you to do two things. The first would be to tell somebody about that decision that you've made. Uh, Jesus said at one point, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. So it's an important step to tell someone. If you're here with us in the building, I encourage you uh, to tell someone here. I know Pastor Donna will be up here at our altar when service is over. She would be really excited to hear about that decision that you've made. Uh, if you're not here, uh, send us a message. Let us know or tell somebody. Now, the second thing I'll tell you is to, is to get planted in church. Whether or not you go to church has absolutely nothing to do with whether God loves you or whether he'll bless you or any of those, any of those things. But God established a church because he knows how much that we need it that we need fellowship, we need each other. We need to get around people who are moving in the right direction. So if you're with us online, find yourself a church. We'd love to see you here in person. If you don't live in our area, find a church where you live, where you can get planted and you can get connected. And I know that will be a blessing in your life. And with that, I'll have Pastor Tammy come and close our service. Praise the Lord, family. Don't forget tomorrow night jam session right here at seven o'clock. So all of our instrumentalists, musicians, singers, we would love if you would just come and hang out with us tomorrow night. Doesn't mean you have to lead worship next week, but if you're ready to join a team, we would love to start building more teams so that we have multiple singers and musicians and you know, many hands make light the work. So we would love to build those teams. So come on out tomorrow night, seven o'clock. Tomorrow night is also our department head and team leader meeting and that starts at 6.30 over in the children's area and that is a potluck. So come on out for that if you are one of our team leads. And then for our summer movie series, this will be the first Friday of every month June 3rd, July 1st, August 5th, and September 2nd, we're going to be watching the first season of The Chosen. And so we'll do two episodes a night to cover the whole season. It'll be a fun time to get out of the heat, get together with family, just have a fun family movie night together. And then, of course, don't forget Vacation Bible School is happening in June, and we still need a lot of help with that. You can sign up at the info counter or talk to Leslie over in Children's. And, oh, Leslie's right here. Thanks, Leslie. And um, so such a great time getting ready to reach the children of our community. And it's such a great outreach. We have a lot of children who are not churched anywhere. And so we really want to reach them with the love and the gospel of Jesus. Amen. So help us out with that in June. All right, stand with me and we'll close in prayer. All of our regular things, Bible studies and all those going on. If you have questions about anything going on, please check at the info counter. Make sure you are on our weekly email list so that you get to hear about all those great things. Father, in Jesus' name, we do give you thanks and praise for today, Lord God. Thank you for bringing us all together to worship together, to hear the word together, to simply be family together. God, I pray blessing on my church family as we go. I thank you that your face shines on them, that grace abounds to them, and that you give them peace. Thank you, Father God, that every day, as soon as they wake up, they say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. What an incredible message. My dad really knows how to bring it. You can also check us out on our online resources where you can see the past sermons or announcements. You can also see the prayer line below to give us a phone call or you can email us until we meet again.